I am thrilled to welcome Jennifer Risher, author of We Need to Talk and founder of hashtag half my DAF, D-A-F, meaning donor advised fund, which launched in May of this year to inspire more charitable giving um, during these uncertain times. So Jen has a fascinating story that led to the writing of this book and she'll share it with you. Uh, joining her is our moderator, Robin Richards Donahoe of the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, um, where she is a founder and managing director of Draper International and Draper Richards Funds, with over 28 years of experience in domestic and international venture capital. Welcome, Jennifer and Robin. Welcome, everyone. I'm Robin Richards Donahoe, and I will be your moderator tonight for a discussion about Jim Risher's book, We Need to Talk, a memoir about wealth. Thank you to our sponsors, Women Lit and the Batteries, for celebrating this book launch. And once again, you can buy this book at the uh, end of this session from an independent bookstore and we'll supply that information. And don't forget to put your questions in the question and answer box. And we will select a few of these for Jennifer to answer um, at the end of our discussion. So I met Jen through her husband, David, whom we backed at our venture philanthropy fund called Draper Richards Kaplan. He had just launched World Reader, a nonprofit offering digital reading programs designed to keep kids learning, and we helped him grow and scale this wonderful company. Early on, I met David's wife, Jen, and besides sharing a love for Spain, we found that we shared a love for tennis and have been playing together for many years since. So Jennifer Risher was born in Seattle, Washington, grew up in Oregon, and graduated from Connecticut College. She joined Microsoft in the early 1990s, where she worked in campus recruiting and then as a product manager. Jen, her husband David, and their two daughters lived in Barcelona, Spain for seven years. They moved to Napa Valley in uh, 2011 and to San Francisco in 2014. So Jen, I really enjoyed your book. You're very vulnerable um, and write really well about a complex topic. In fact, just last week, Paul Sullivan of the New York Times wrote an article about your book and the topic of demystifying our relationship with money. So as we start this discussion about wealth, I want to make the obvious caveat that there is so much need in the world right now. And there's so much wealth disparity. So we approach the subject with a huge dose of humility, but like the subject of Black Lives Matter, we need to start a conversation about this emotionally charged and difficult subject of disparity. So welcome, Jen. And my first question is, tell me why you wrote the book. Thank you, Robin. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's, I wish I could see you all. <laughs> so, um, so I just start by saying, you know, I am very lucky. Uh, when I was 25, I joined Microsoft and I met my husband, David, and I got stock that ended up being worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And six years later, when David and I were married and expecting our first child, David took a job at a small unknown startup that was selling books on the internet called Amazon.com. We were in our early 30s, the company went public, and we had more money than we could wrap our heads around. And wealth surprised me. You know, having a lot of money doesn't look or feel like what Hollywood sells us. I didn't find myself in a big sparkly club, hanging out and sharing financial secrets. I found myself more in a strange, silent space where no one was talking much about money at all. There were all these new challenges, but no one was discussing their upset over a sibling's resentment or their worry about raising spoiled, entitled children or their own ambivalence. 
There were no dialogues about whether to give to family members or how to best approach philanthropy. Even though for most people, these challenges are new. Eight out of 10 people with wealth grew up middle class or poor. Now it may sound strange to think of wealth as a challenge that needs to be overcome. And I do wanna say upfront that money makes life easier. No one needs to shed any tears over my situation. I'm very lucky. But wealth can be isolating. So normally, if I have a problem or a question, I turn to friends. I want to figure out, should our 16-year-old have a curfew? So basically, I ask everyone I know. It's kind of how I do my research. I ask people their advice, I get their ideas, I hear about their experiences, I get different perspectives. And just talking is helpful. You know, it lets me know that my question is normal, that it's valid, and that it's shared. But the same doesn't happen with money. And I couldn't talk to friends about having a lot of it. So I thought I'll turn to books, but there are no books. I wrote my book because my story is one I'd want to know about if it hadn't happened to me. I also wrote my book for the millions of Americans like me who have more money than they had growing up or who have more money than most in their extended family or who have more money than their friends. You know, we have this idea of wealth as a, as a fantasy that we hold in our heads, and the reality can be lonely and strange. So I'm telling my story to help other people understand their own. And my goal is not to show people how to do rich right. I don't have the answer for that. My story is not prescriptive. I'm offering up a story that hasn't been told, that discusses things like how hard it can be to navigate a vacation with another family that doesn't share your resources, or how upsetting it is to feel a friend's jealousy and not be able to share what's really going on in your life, or how painful it can be to feel as though your parents disapprove of what you have. I want to normalize these experiences, validate them. I want to demystify wealth and help us see that we are all a lot more alike than different. I also wrote this book to get us talking. So money is a taboo subject, but it doesn't have to be. And the more I've talked about money, the more I realize that it's not money that we don't talk about. It's the emotions behind the money that we often avoid. And these emotions are universal. No matter how much you have in your bank account, if you have parents, if you have a partner, friends, siblings, you probably know that money is uncomfortable to discuss. We're afraid. We're afraid of hurting other people's feelings. We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of not measuring up or of sounding unknowledgeable. We all have money shame and money guilt. We all have a money story. And our money stories start in childhood. And I'll read to you a little from my book about my childhood and about my parents' background. So while I was growing up, there had always been a rainy day lurking in the living room. My mother stuck closely to her grocery list, used the same tea bag for a second and third cup of tea, and only drove when necessary because gas was expensive. When my father sat at his desk, opening envelopes and paying bills and clouds of cigarette smoke, I knew to tiptoe past. Finances made him grumpy. The oldest of five, my father had grown up in Middletown, New York, where he rushed to the dinner table to gulp down his food before someone else could claim it. His father had dropped out of school in eighth grade to work, and his mother was a second grade teacher. The family didn't have much money. 
Although my grandfather worked his way up in a bank, eventually becoming branch president, my father continued to worry about getting enough to eat. Meanwhile, my mother, an only child, grew up middle, upper middle class in Flint, Michigan. Her father was a prominent lawyer, her mother a volunteer on the lo local hospital board, and both were keenly aware of proper etiquette. They participated in theater group and bridge club and were careful to keep up appearances. When, when she was scrubbing the floor in a house coat and curlers and a stranger rang the doorbell, my grandmother put on an accent and pretended to be the help. The lady of the house isn't home, she said. So when I was in high school, and maybe you also have this experience, um, my best friend and I asked each other, what would you do if you had a million dollars? Have you asked yourself that question? Well, I thought, I'd, I was in a fantasy land. Of course, I'd have a cute boyfriend and a fancy car. But really, I thought all that money would change everything, that my life would be perfect. And I think we often set ourselves up this way, thinking, if only, then my life will be perfect. And we do it a lot around money. If only I got that big promotion. We do it around other things too. If only I could lose 20 pounds or if only I met the right person, then my life would be perfect. A friend of mine told me how she used to lie in bed at night, unable to sleep thinking, if only I could make $100,000. And then she started laughing because she was making more than that, but she was still lying in bed at night, unable to sleep. I had an if only happen, and I'm still me. <laughs> I still have insecurities, my feelings get hurt, I make mistakes, and I'm not in a fantasy land. Our view of wealth is so narrow and incomplete. We see the glitz and the glamor, we see the corruption and the greed, we know the Kardashians and the Real Housewives, the men of Wolf of Wall Street. We know about Jeffrey Epstein and the parents who illegally tried to get their unqualified students into top schools. We see the highly visible wealth and the stereotypes. But remember, eight out of 10 people with wealth grew up middle class or poor. They are you. And they aren't acknowledging this strange phenomenon that wealth doesn't look or feel like what Hollywood sells us. It creates distance in relationships with family and friends. And it doesn't come with a handbook that tells you how to hire a good financial advisor or how to come up with a philanthropic strategy or how to raise kids that aren't spoiled. And there are all these questions, but we aren't talking to each other. Why aren't we talking? Well, I know why. One, wealth is a taboo subject, but it doesn't have to be. And two, when you have wealth, you lose the right to complain. No one wants to sound ungrateful and no one wants to be judged. It's easier to stay quiet. But I can't stay quiet. I think it's incredibly important to shine a light on reality and start a conversation that isn't yet happening. There is an incredible amount of suffering in our country right now. People are going without housing, without health care, without food. There's an education crisis. I think it might sound far reaching, but I think talking can help us fight income inequality. Our silence has a lot of power. Silence allows the status quo to remain. When we're silent, we don't examine our relationship with money. When we're silent, we can stay in our bubble unaware and not necessarily holding ourselves accountable. 
When there is a large and influential segment of our population that feels isolated and estranged, they're probably not at their most generous or empathetic. And they aren't necessarily holding themselves accountable or inspired to make change. I hope my book becomes a catalyst for conversation. And I include things like private school auctions and private jets. You'll see the luxuries and freedom that money can buy. But I also include a candid look at the personal emotional challenges that arise. And I bet you'll be surprised. The specifics might be different, but I bet you'll be able to relate to my experiences. Now, towards the end of my writing process, I um, interviewed 11 women. I wanted to include different voices and different perspectives. And when I thought about reaching out to people and asking them to talk to me about wealth, I was very nervous. I, it was very uncomfortable. But I had to push through that discomfort just to send a couple emails to a couple of acquaintances. And when I did, the response was amazing. People wrote me back right away and said, I think about these things all the time, but I never discuss them. And then when we got together, the conversations were so validating, so comforting. We talked about our children, our parents, feelings of isolation. We shared all sorts of things in common. We weren't alone. So I spent a lot of time alone <laughs> writing this book. I have been writing for 14 years. And during this time, I've been to a couple of writers workshops and writers conferences. And probably about four years in, I went to a writers workshop called the Squaw Valley Writers Workshop. And this took place over a weekend. And I remember during the first, the opening speaker was, was we had, were all gathered in the room and there were probably two or 300 of us. And the opening speaker said, you know, look around yourself. You're surrounded by people who love the written word, who share a love of the, the story. This is a weekend. You are all kindred spirits. You're going to support and learn from each other. And I thought this sounded wonderful. I had basically been teaching myself to write. I saw writing as a puzzle. How was I going to piece together my experiences in a compelling way? How was I going to talk about money in a way that wasn't off-putting or offensive? So I was thrilled. I couldn't wait to talk to other people about writing. But then I realized it was going to be tough to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jennifer. I'm writing about having a lot of money. It just doesn't go over well. And I actually spent some time crying in my room. <laughs> and I remember one woman I introduced myself to and I told her about what I was writing about. And she looked at me and she said, you don't look rich. And I didn't take it as a compliment. Um, so whether you look rich or not, whether you are rich or not, I want to invite you to get uncomfortable. Get vulnerable. You all can think of that thing in your life, the awkward money situation that's hanging over your head. Maybe it's with a parent. Maybe it's with one of your kids. Maybe a friend, a sibling. We all have these things that we're avoiding discussing, but get uncomfortable because on the other side is a sense of real connection and a sense of relief. And I'll share some stories with you. So um, I have a friend who's middle class and she told me that she and her husband drove the same car for years, years and years. And the thing finally broke down, she said, and she bought an Audi Q5. And she loved that car. She'd wanted that car forever. And when she was thinking about visiting her sister and driving up in the car, she began to worry about being judged. In her mind, she heard her sister saying, Ooh, aren't we fancy? Probably too good for us now. And then in her mind, she started to justify the car. Well, it was used. It wasn't that expensive. Even before she saw her sister, she was making assumptions and telling herself stories. 
What if she'd actually talked to her sister? You know, when we don't talk about something, it looms large and takes on a life of its own. When we don't talk about it, we give money a lot of power. And I'll share another story. This is with me and my brother. I have a brother who is two years younger than me. And when he graduated from college, he went into the Peace Corps. And then he got a master's in Spanish and became a high school Spanish teacher. And this was many years ago. He, at this time, he wanted to buy a house. And David and I offered him $20,000 for the down payment. And he refused our gift. He said he wanted to live within his own means. And his refusal hurt my feelings. I thought he was looking down at me and our money, but I didn't say anything to him. Um, several years later, when he was getting married, um, David and I again sent a check as a wedding gift, and this time he accepted. And a couple years after that, when his first child was born, we again wrote a check and he and his wife thanked us. And we began to write checks every year. And over the course of several years, he stopped acknowledging our gifts. So I'd write a check in December and hear silence. It was like the money was disappearing into a void. And I was beginning to feel resentful and a little taken for granted, but I didn't say anything. Instead, I made up stories in my head. Oh, he's embarrassed. Or he thinks we have so much money that it's just, it means nothing to us. And then just a couple years ago, and I'm not proud to admit it, I just didn't send a check. And that next January, when we were communicating over email, um, at the end of one of his notes, he said, wondering if a certain year-end check is just late in the mail, is it? I was shocked and angry, and I knew we had to talk, especially since I was writing a book about talking about money. But it's not easy. I had to sit down. I really had to think through how I felt, what I wanted to say. We set up a time to call. And when I got on the phone, I said, you know, I, my feelings are hurt that you have not thanked us for our gifts. And he apologized right away. He said, you know, I didn't realize. I thought it was more comfortable for you if I just didn't make a big deal of the money. And it was such a relief to talk our conversation brought us together. And then as two people who love and trust each other, we could actually talk about money. It put money in its place, not as something bigger than the two of us, but as a tool and a benefit. So after that, he said, you know, I don't need this money, but I really appreciate it. And I said, I'd never asked. I said, you know, I don't care what you're doing with it, but I wanna know. I wanna be part of your life. Another story, um, a friend of mine, and this was a year after the fact, told me that she almost hadn't invited our family to join hers to see a Cirque du Soleil show. And I, I didn't had no idea and I asked her why. And she said, you know, I agonized for weeks I was worried that you'd only want to sit in front row seats, which our family can't afford. And I felt terrible. I hated to think of her worrying about the finances. You know, our friendship meant more to me than front row seats. Didn't she know that? But the fact that she said something and trusted me enough to talk about money made me feel closer to her. It also made me more aware of how out of touch I could be, which is another reason for talking. Um, let me end um, by talking a little bit about philanthropy. So just as we all have a money story that begins in childhood, I think we learn about giving and, and charitable giving um, during our childhood. And for me, uh, my mom and I took canned peaches to food drives, and we took clothes to the Goodwill. 
But I never really learned about charitable giving. I never saw my parents making financial donations. It wasn't until I was at Microsoft and surrounded by peers who were giving that I gave a small percentage of my paycheck to the United Way. And the next step was really starting to give to places that had given to me. So my husband and I gave to NPR and we gave to the nonprofit that organized my mother's group. And I wanted to be doing more. I felt a responsibility and obligation, but I also had a desire to do something, give back. And I, I felt overwhelmed because I didn't know where I wanted to give. I didn't know how to go about it. I wanted to do the research. I wanted to do it perfectly. And it was during this time when I was you know, grappling with this, I wanted a plan. Um, it was during this time I drove off the highway, off ramp, and I saw a homeless man standing on the corner. And I was behind a number of cars and I you know, was inching my way, or cl way closer to him. And as I got close, I just stared straight ahead. I was basically willing the car in front of me to move forward so I could get past him. And as I made that turn, got, getting past him, I heard a voice. Mom, why is that man standing there? Is he hungry? Did his sign say he was hungry? Did he want money? Do you have money? Why didn't you give him any money? And these were good questions. A couple days later, my, David and I were having um, dinner with some friends and I told them about this experience and how I felt. And we all, as we talked, realized we need to be more generous. And we decided to challenge each other and ourselves to giving away $1,000, $100 at a time. And I write about that experience in my book. And I'll end um, with that reading um, about that experience. The following week with a $100 bill folded in the pocket of my dark purple coat, I walked into the dry cleaners to the sound of the bell and smell of hot wool. After paying and picking up the clothes, hardly noticing the metal hangers digging into my palm or worrying about the dangers of plastic bags, I focused all my energy on getting the timing right. Happy holidays, I practically shouted, handing the woman $100. After years of greetings and pleasantries, it was as though the two of us saw each other for the first time. We stared. I smiled. She nodded. Thank you very much, she said. You're welcome, I said. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to come in here. Then I scurried out the door. That evening, when I told David about the experience, his face contorted. I gave some money away, too, he said. You know the woman at Starbucks? The one who makes perfect latte foam, I asked. You gave her $100? I did, he said, but well, I went in there planning to tell her what a great barista she was, but there was a long line, so I waited around. Did she notice you? I'm sure she did. I was hanging out looking at espresso machines for quite a long time. Finally, I got a coffee as an excuse to talk to her, but it was like a comedy. Just as I got up to the counter, she went over to arrange things on the shelves. What did you do? It was so awkward. Why didn't you just leave? I should have, but, but I was determined. I went over to her and, and let her know that we thought she was a great barista and handed her $100, but she refused to take it. Oh no, yeah, it was bad, he said, beginning to laugh. It got worse, I didn't give up, I insisted. Finally, she told me to put the money in the tip jar. Did you? Yes, and then ran out of the store. Several weeks later, David had more success. On our way to Napa, we stopped at an In-N-Out Burger. David placed our order while Emily, Allie, and I found a table and arranged napkins ready for our meal. Suddenly, David was standing by my side, asking for one of our special bills. I handed him $100 and watched him hurry back to the counter, where he stopped in front of a young couple. He said something to the woman, then handed her the bill. 
She covered her mouth and began hopping up and down while the man pumped David's hand a huge smile on his face. When I was paying for the food, I needed 10 cents, David told me when he returned to the table. I was fishing around in my pocket trying to come up with a change and that guy gave me a dime. And you gave him $100? That's right, did you see his reaction? He looked ecstatic, I said. He looked the way this makes me feel. I had no idea what $100 meant to the couple or what they would do with the money, but I felt connected to them, our lives touching for a warm, happy moment. The element of surprise was joyous too. Whether a dime, a dollar, or a hundred, being charitable was not about amounts or philanthropic strategy, but about opening our hearts and doing our personal best to make a positive difference in one another's lives. We'll end there. Thank you so much, Jen. What a great overview of everything that uh, you are saying in this book. There's there's so much to unpack. And I love that you, you um, put questions at the end of every chapter. Um, do you uh, have any advice how you would like people to use this book? Um, thanks for that question, because yes, I do have advice. <laughs> I think this is a great book to read with a parent. I mean, remember, you're supposed to get uncomfortable here. But if you both read the book together, it will be a great tool to, to discuss issues. And yes, those prompts at, at the end of every chapter are good ways to kind of break the ice and start conversations. So I'd love to see people read it for themselves, but read it with a partner and then discuss it. Read it with a friend. Read it with your sister or one of your, your children. And it's a great way to really start those conversations that are difficult to, to start. Um, I think it's a great book club book. Here you have a group of people that you feel comfortable with and um, a setup where you can talk about, about the book. And this is a great segue into talking about money because we can all share our stories. Um, it's hearing other people's stories that, that help us understand our own. So I'm hoping that, that it, it becomes a book club book as well. That's great. Okay. So the question that always, uh, every parent wants to ask is how do you keep from spoiling your kids? You know, no one wants to raise spoiled kids. This is true. And I think, yes, with, with wealth they're at, there's a new layer there. And um, yeah, I think you can talk to your kids, but when they're little, it's not about a sit down and here are our values or here's what we think. It's, it's knowing and living your values um, day to day, week to week, year to year. Your kids are watching you. So they see what you do. They see how you interact with other people. It's, it's being aware of other people. It's being respectful and having an attitude that's respectful. And it's, it's moving through the world with gratitude. Um, just thinking about, you know, taking your kids with you to the grocery store. How, what are they seeing? How do they see you react when someone sneaks into the parking spot before you do? What happens when you walk into the store? How are you interacting with other people in the store? How are you making your decisions? What are you buying? What are you not buying? Are you making choices? Do they see you making trade-offs? Do they see you caring about what you're buying and how much you're spending? And then how do you interact with the guy at the meat, meat counter? Are you respectful there? And when you're checking out, the same. I mean, every little detail um, is telling and is telling something to your children. So it really is, you know, living those values and, and, and thinking about what you're talking about around the dinner table. Are you talking about the next thing you want to buy, the next toy you want, or, or what are you worried about? Do you worry about um, making sure that everyone's included? Are you worrying about, you know, are you talking about education and accomplishments, experiences? What are you proud of in your life? Do your kids hear you saying how fortunate you are? Or do they hear you feeling deserving? It's, it's all these little cues. They see what you prioritize during your day. They hear what you're talking about over the dinner table. So 
I think it's really um, a matter of looking within yourself and thinking, okay, how, how do I want to be in the world? How do I want my children to grow up and be in the world? So I'll just give an anecdote. I was a kid that grew up with a successful entrepreneurial father, and, but he had grown up in the Depression and uh, had served in World War II, so was very thrifty, uh, drove a basic Ford all his life, even as he became more successful. Um, and I remember as one of seven kids that I uh, had this rare opportunity that I was going to the movie theater, just me and my dad. And I knew that he would really like it if I popped the popcorn at home and snuck it into the theater because he was so thrifty, you know, and that was a value that was in our house. And of course he loved it. And that became our thing is whenever we went to the movie together that I always made popcorn at home and stuck it into the theater, you know, even, even when it was, you know, ridiculous because he was, you know, had a company that was incredibly successful. So I'm just um, amplifying that these values are taught to us um, when we're young and they stay with you all your life. And then you then, you know, want to uh, often uh, mimic the same thing with your kids. Um, I will say that being from uh, a small town where your father is the largest employer, um, I was so conscious of wanting people to only know me by my first name and not my last name because in a small town, everyone would immediately um, pin me as the, the rich kid. And I just retrospectively believe that all my, you know, leaving my town, leaving the South, moving to the West, being, um, you know, very driven to have my own successful career is very much that desire to distance myself from this, you know, moniker of, you know, wealth and things come easily to you. And I think a lot of that is just because it was so hard for everyone to talk about it. Um, so um, I will um, finish by just saying, I think that, um, you know, this is obviously so important to talk with your spouse about. And I love how in the book you, uh, you know, really talk about the fights that you have with David and also how you got through the communication and came out the other end. Um, all the back and forth of the diamond ring. And, and, the, and it's, um, so I will say, you know, in my situation, my husband and I uh, have, we came into a relationship with, a big imbalance and we have to talk and talk and talk about it. And um, as we know, you know, marriage is work. And um, I think that um, this is a great book for couples to read if there is that imbalance. Um, okay, so now I want to um, take a question from the audience. Yes, hello. Um, well, just one uh, comment. We've gotten um, quite a few comments. One of them says, I admire that you wrote a book about this very tough subject. So uh, that was a question slash comment, um, more appreciation. Um, one question that came in, um, wondering if any of the women interviewed, those you mentioned in the book, were people of color and if that enters the conversation with other people of wealth. That's a great question, and I wish the answer were yes, because um, I would like to have that representation, but I think the sad truth, for one, is that income inequality is huge, and among whites and blacks, it's even bigger. The typical white family has makes 10 times more than the typical black family. That's a tragedy that we need to change. So the way I interviewed people really was initially, like I said, I was really nervous. I, I sent two notes out to people that were in my orbit and they're both white. Um, 
And then from there, it sort of was organic because each one of them said, oh my God, you've got to talk to so-and-so. So then I kind of spread out based on who people kind of recommended I talk to. Um, and it, it was not, you know, it was not perfect research. It was just kind of, you know, people telling people who in the, the excitement of, of this conversation kind of growing. Um, so I, that's the answer to, my, to that question. Um, but that's a good question. And if I write another book, I will be much more diligent about, you know, talking to a broader range of people. But again, I think the sad truth is, you know, the wealth is, is, is predominantly white just because of the way our society is right now. And, and again, that needs to change. I will say, I think your husband is, his story is just so remarkable of, of, of how, just where he comes well, from. So I think what Robin's trying to say, and I, you know, my husband is African American, so that is one piece of, of something, I guess. Um, so he has, so he grew up with a single mom. Um, his parents were divorced when he was seven, and he has a younger brother. And so he and his brother grew up with their mom. And he, when he recounts his childhood, it was a very happy childhood. Um, but he also remembers his mom on the phone with the neighborhood day camp pleading with them to take her kids for free because she had to go to work. So they didn't have a lot of money when he was growing up. Yeah. Another question? Yeah? Okay. Um, question, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, what is your reaction or response to people with little or no money you meet as you travel the world? Do you feel guilt, indifference, responsibility, perhaps all of the above? You know, um, well, so my husband did found a um, nonprofit that works uh, with in, within the developing world, um, starting in Ghana and Kenya. And so we did travel to, to Ghana and, and, and with the girls and we were in the classroom with a bunch of kids. And it was amazing because the kids were really drawn to our kids and, and um, our girls read with, with, with the classroom. And, um, you know, the amount of money that we had sort of fell away because there was so much excitement about education. There's so much value placed on education in, in countries like Ghana and Kenya and so much excitement about reading that, yeah, we were surrounded by kids who had, you know, relatively little, but it, it, that, it, that didn't matter. Um, so that has been the experience when we travel, we try to experience the culture. So we aren't, you know, driving around, we're, we're getting on public transportation. Um, we have also done, when we went to China, we worked in a school for two weeks. We lived in a dorm and um, with our kids, we're in a classroom every day teaching kindergartners, um, which was a fabulous experience. Um, and we've been super fortunate to be able to have these experiences and travel. But I think that's part of like showing and seeing for ourselves the world and different cultures. And, you know, as I think about it now, just as I, you know, it, it's not about the money. It's really when you see humanity and you see people um, following their passions, doing their lives and being the best they can be um, and experiencing their lives you know, it's, it's a wonderful way to connect. And I think that's ultimately, you know, connecting with other people is really, you know, what it's all about, feeling a sense of purpose and making a difference in the world and finding those connections. Um, so when we travel, we try to find connections. Okay, um, it's sort of related question, maybe coming at that a little bit differently and um, even encouraging to go even, even deeper. Someone will asks, how do you balance whether you build yourself a second home or give away the several million dollars it would cost to worthy causes? And I might add to that how you observe um, the community of wealth making these decisions and, and how the, the sort of community interacts, how you look at other people um, making these decisions. Well, when you say community of wealth, you're talking about a lot of different individuals. I mean, it's easy to lump people together and yeah, maybe many people share this thing called wealth, 
but they've come at it from a lot of different perspectives and um, they're, they have a diverse group of, or, you know, opinions and, and ways of looking at things. They have, they each have their own money story. So depending on how they grew up, how they grew up giving or not giving that plays a role. So I think, you know, I think I'd like to think that most people are doing their best with, with the tools that they have. And so, you know, how can I answer for someone else about what they choose um, in terms of buying that second house or giving it away. It's, it's really about your values and what you think is important and what you want to, how you want to show up in the world. Um, so I can't answer for anyone else, but I can say that we are fortunate enough to be able to enjoy. Um, and it took me a long time to be able to actually enjoy the, the, what money can buy in terms of a house. Um, but I think more, more than that, we've spent a lot of money on experiences because as, you know, experiences as a family, experiences with other people. Um, and we have, I mean, I guess I'll mention it now. Uh, thanks for mentioning it earlier, Sherilyn. So when um, COVID hit, we really felt a need and a desire to help because we just saw so much need out there. And we knew that nonprofits who were trying to do the work to help other people were struggling because they couldn't hold their luncheons, they couldn't hold their galas, they couldn't, the funding was drying up and they couldn't even go into the office. How are we gonna you know, help these nonprofits through? And my husband and I wanted to give money to nonprofits. At the same time, we knew that there was a lot of money stuck in donor advised funds and just briefly, a donor advised fund is sort of like a charitable checking account. You can put money in it, you get that tax um, break, and then you can divvy it out over time. But what's happened is it's getting stuck there. So we wanted to encourage people to move that money through those donor advised funds to nonprofits now, because now's the moment. And we wanted people to give, commit to giving at least half that money. And we put up a million dollars in matching grants to encourage people to give. And I'm excited to say that others joined us. Other individuals came in and added to our matching pool. So we were able to give away $1.4 million in matching grants. And our goal really was to inspire giving. People could give wherever they wanted. The only thing we wouldn't match was anything that promoted gun violence or hate speech. But other than that, people could choose where they wanted to give and we would match. And we, we, we gave uh, $600,000 worth of matches in the middle of July to 147 nonprofits. And we're about to come up to the final um, end of the challenge at the end of September, where we'll give away $800,000 um, to a, another group of very worthy nonprofits. Um, so, that's been super rewarding, not only in seeing that our million dollars has helped move, but at this point over $6 million. So our money has gone further. So the numbers are adding up and that's a great thing. But I think also talking to other donors has been super rewarding, talking to nonprofits, helping them understand donor advised funds and seeing donors and nonprofits build relationships. We've had donors say to us, you know, Thank you. This is the nudge we needed. We've been inspired. We're sitting around the dinner table. Our adult kids are home right now. So we're having conversations about giving, about our values, about where we want to give. We're having conversations about money that we wouldn't otherwise have had. And that's very rewarding. And I think it's really positive. Jen, any desire to um, keep going with this past September because absolutely yeah. this has been so fun and so such a success and so many people have joined us it does feel like this is building a community and we we're definitely going to plan half my DAF 2021 if you're interested in joining us if you're interested in hearing more please let me know um, I'd love to in that you know in that in 2021 have a focus on racial justice um, I also want to do something that's similar to what we've done already, which really is just to say, give, give now. Now is the moment. Thanks for asking. Great. Robin, should I jump in with another question? Yes. 
Okay, great. There's just fantastic questions coming in. Um, so uh, Tanya asks, um, love this topic and that you're opening up the dialogue. How do you address the uneven power dynamics when opening up these discussions? There are some who may not want to discuss due to shame of not having money, given the way our society places value on you based on material wealth. It's a big question. And yeah, there we all, I mean, there's a lot of shame around money at every level, guilt. And I mean, we, it's such an emotional topic. Um, I think we need to start kind of talking to people who are closest to us. So it's talking to your partner. If you don't already do that, it's talking to a parent. It's looking around and thinking, you know, where, where is that money, you know, awkward money situation hanging over my head? How can I talk, talk about it rather than avoid it? And yeah, the bigger picture is, you know, we're not talking about this on a larger scale. It's all sort of theoretical. We're not honestly looking at wealth in a way that we need to. It's, you know, Hollywood's showing us one picture. And I think by talking, I, I hope this sort of starts a grassroots conversation that gets us talking to each other and, and breaks the silence around money as a taboo subject and um, helps us come together because ultimately when it comes to our basic human needs and desires, we are 99% the same. Mm -hmm. It's just a fall. Oh, go ahead, Robin. No, I was just going to say today at lunch, we were with a couple that um, we could have um, small talked the whole way through, but um, the woman said at the very beginning, you know, if you don't mind, I'd love to get your advice on how you talk to your kids about your, you know, the family income and, and just, you know, as they get older, uh, how are you going to talk to your kids about money? And it turned into this really um, wonderful conversation that was really about our values and then about their values. But the point is, um, People are a lot more open than you think, um, and it really draws you to other people to have these uh, very, you know, sort of frank and, uh, you know, open-hearted discussions. So I, I always, I'm so glad when people are brave enough to bring up, a, you know, what would otherwise be like a buzzkill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I want to jump in there because, um, Robin, you, it reminds me of when David and I were, you know, we'd always let our kids know that they were very fortunate. But when um, our oldest was going to college, we thought, well, we should tell them a little bit more about, you know, what they have and what we have. And it just felt overwhelming to think about it. Like, was it going to dampen their ambition or, you know, was it going to feel overwhelming to them? And, and we didn't know what we were doing. So we actually did, especially since I was writing the book, my husband sent out some notes to, to different couples and said, could we sit down with you and have a conversation? And it was amazing. You open the door to people and they rush in because we had, we got answers back right away. Yes, let's have dinner. And then we had, you know, three separate dinners with people where we really shared stories. And a lot of these couples were ahead of us. So they were telling us, yeah, we, we had our kids meet with their financial advisor. We, we wrote a letter to each of the kids. We had them meet with a financial advisor on their own to, to, to create that relationship. We wanted them to know that they had this money and we wanted them to know that we had put money aside to pay for college and that they were going to be using that money. So we got, you know, concrete ideas from the conversations and just it, it normalized it and it, it made it less overwhelming and it kind of opened it opened a dialogue to these couples actually that, that has continued, which is wonderful. How about one last question? Oh my gosh, there's so many good questions. Um, well, let's see. Um, why don't I uh, throw out a couple of questions and you can um, choose How about that. Yeah, that sounds perfect. <laughs> one of them is um, just, just giving us even some specific examples, like what's the best way to open a conversation about money like you're proposing? Are there key phrases or concepts that you'd like to begin with? And a related question, I'll combine the two, um, is if is, Kate asks, if you're in a book club where the rest of the women have a lot less money than you do, how do you handle that, please? 
Well, I think, you know, there is no formula. I wish I could just tell you that there's a formula, but I think the best thing is to set up a time that's comfortable for everyone and to acknowledge that, okay, this is going to be uncomfortable and, and say that up front and say, you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I don't have answers. I, I'm just going to raise this issue. And the more you can kind of realize how you're feeling and share that, I think the better. I mean, if you sit down and think about a certain situation that you want to talk to someone about and you realize, oh, I'm, I'm feeling really competitive with this person. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying anything because I, I, we're kind of in this, talk about that. Or I'm feeling, you know, insecure. I feel like they are looking down at me. And I, if I say, bring this up, I'm, I'm going to be less than say it. I mean, it really is just, just that hard. <laughs> and, and it is, you know, setting aside the time and telling the other person, let's, let's try this. Let's try it for 10 minutes and see where it goes. And based on my experience with this type of thing, it, it, you're going to feel closer to that person. They're going to be thankful that you care enough to try to work through an issue that, I mean, if you're feeling it, they're feeling it. Um, we're pretty attuned to these things. So I would say just, just give it a try. And for the book club question, I mean, I, um, I don't know how much time we have, but I had, a, when I was in a mother's group, I had this same situation. I write about this experience in the book where I felt like I couldn't talk to people. I mean, sometimes, and then looking back and I think, oh, I wish I had said something because, you know, those bridges happen with some people. Sometimes it won't happen. I mean, that, that's true of anything. So some people won't be able to hear your message. But I think if you're open and honest and come at it with humility and su say, suggest that you want to discuss this, I think most people will respect that and, and reach towards you because um, no one's good at this. We're all kind of in this is kind of silent space together. So yeah, I mean, I would, I'd encourage you to try and um, I wish you luck. <laughs> I would uh, just add that I, I do think if it's difficult to talk about this, maybe start talking either one-on-one -on -one or, you know, two on two, it's difficult to launch into, you know, six other people who are, might be surprised by your question. And I can't say enough about how good the questions are in the book. They are great conversation starters. So, um, I'll just wrap up by really encouraging everyone to buy this book and enjoy this book. It's, um, it's going to lead to some really wonderful conversations. Jen, you did an amazing job tonight. So proud of you. And um, I'd like to close just by thanking the battery um, for partnering on this event. And if you'd like a copy of We Need to Talk, there's going to be um, a link that's going to pop up right after this. Um, and it lets you buy it from an indie bookstore, which we all want to support. So I'm Robin Richards Donahoe, and you've been watching Women Lit Unbound. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Robin. Thanks, Women Lit.